Where do old aeroplanes go when the time comes to retire them from the sky? Almost one in ten of them are flown to eCube Solutions in Wales, one of the world's fastest growing facilities for the recycling and stripping out of old aircraft. Whatever the customer wants, we'll take off. Every year, around 60 commercial airliners land at the company's designated airbase, and the lads just can't wait to get their hands on them. All these planes, and you just get to play with the biggest toy set in the world. This squadron of high-vis heroes love to get their hands dirty and fly in the face of whatever problems are thrown at them. Yeah, there's pressure. Um, we cope with it, we thrive on it. They join forces to take these old airliners to pieces so their thousands of mechanical components can be sold on to satisfy the growing global demand for refurbished plane parts. Let's get them off the aircraft. But it's a race against the clock to take these multi-million pound planes to pieces before they reach their final destination, the scrapyard. All these are ready to go now, so we're going to have the demolition boys are going to be coming in and they're going to start smashing them up. Join the lads as they battle hostile weather and get to grips with massive machinery. I've seen them go down smoother, put it that way. All to meet deadlines set by bullish buyers. Money's time, time's money. And we're not talking peanuts here, we're talking millions. Welcome to the world of the plane reclaimers. So, good job, Ben. Yeah. <laughs> In Wales, sometimes it doesn't rain, it pours. And by the looks of things, today it's really hammering it down. Most of the takeout and teardown boys are happy dodging the deluge by taking shelter in the hangars, busying themselves with the business of stripping, scrapping and packing valuable plane parts from ageing aircraft that have clocked up some serious mileage. The planes may be past it, but technician Timo is still very much in the prime of his life. We've got a, a A321 due in soon. We've got a 737 in the hangar. And um, pretty soon we're out to uh, a little bit of a jaunt out there on the airfield to see uh, the end of an era. Uh, we've got some tornadoes doing a fly past because they're uh, being decommissioned. I like it in here, and they know I like it in here. And experience has taught me that uh, this is the best place to be, especially on a day like today. And. Um, uh, looks can be deceiving because I'm only 27, but I'm very experienced. Clearly very young at heart, Timo is a man of considerable experience. When it comes to passing on that wealth of aeronautical nous to keep the circle of life flowing, eCube regularly train up new apprentices to learn from the old guard, men of experience like Sam and Bob, who right now are stuck outside patiently scanning the skies for the last aircraft arrival of the day. It says four clocks moving, I spoke to him earlier. The plane the lads are waiting for is an Airbus A321 making its final flight of more than 2,000 miles from Turkey to here in Cardiff. After 23 years of service, her owner believes she is more commercially viable as a parts plane, and they can have all of her valuable components stripped out and sold on. Sam and Bob may be in somewhat of a waiting game, but at least for now, they're dry. And today, things are set to be a touch cosier in the tug because the boys have company. The sky will clear, it should be all right. He's just at five and a half hours in there. These two well-weathered workhorses have been joined in the rain by eager new apprentice Jack, a self-confessed plane geek who's studying aircraft engineering at the local college. He's still at a thousand. You shouldn't be able to see him now. The weather won't dampen Jack's spirits, though, as Sam is about to make this lucky lad's day. He's going to instruct him in the art of marshalling an aircraft. You see it? Yeah. See a spot? Yeah. Keep coming down here a bit. Up and down. Yeah. Like that. Stand on the centre line. Yeah. At just 17 years old, it's a job that Jack has thus far only been able to dream of doing. I'd start waving up and down, yeah? Slow down a bit, slow down a bit. That's it, he's got you, yeah? If I cut, walk backwards a bit, yeah? A bit too close. When he gets closer, too close, you won't see you. He's going to have to carefully listen to every word his mentor, Sam, tells him. 
which is pretty difficult, considering the deafening racket that the aircraft's turbofan engines are making. That's better. From what I get, he's keen as mustard. Dead keen. He's, he really loves aircraft. He's a, a bit of a buff and that. So uh, I think sometimes some people forget, can sometimes forget that he's only a, a young lad who's still in college and maybe give him jobs that are maybe a little bit out of his scope. Under his mentor, steady instruction, this young apprentice has marshaled the plane safely into position. With Sam and Bob happy to pass on their extensive knowledge to the younger generation, it seems that the lads are a fine example of youth and experience. With the crew now departing, the A321 will be shut down for the final time before the lads return tomorrow for the strip out. And with their shift coming to an end for the evening, it seems about time to find out how highly Sam rates young Jack the Apprentice on his very first attempt at marshalling. He was a little bit nervous to start with, but he... Uh... He got there, he missed his mark by about two foot. That's not bad first go. A pretty good effort. The young rookie still has a lot to learn from this wise old hand, but it's a decent first attempt. Guide us straight in. <laughs> That's something I never thought I'd be able to do, something I've never, something one of my dreams, so brilliant. Really, really enjoyed it. That's just blown my mind. A few hours from now, when Jack goes off to bed, it's pretty much a cert that he'll be reliving this experience over in his head and dreaming of the day when he has come of age and will be awarded the trust to marshal in a plane all on his own. Well, you know what, Jack? That day may be closer than you think. It's safe to say that when it comes to retiring aircraft from service, our top team of takeout and teardown boys have pretty much seen it all. But this morning, a request has come in from a customer wanting something a little bit different to come off the engines from the recently landed Airbus A321. And this component promises to be somewhat of a first for veterans of the job, Mark and Bob. So, can these old dogs learn some new tricks? Number one's up there. Oh, that's 21. There we are, number one. The customer's asked us to take each fan blade off individually and check the repair state of them, because that determines the value of the engine. This is the first time we've done this, yeah. First time it's been requested of us. The customer behind this unusual request is Royal Aero's Callum McLeod. We're an engine specialist uh, company which leases engines, buys engines, trades engines for aircraft, but we also sometimes have to buy the complete aircraft to get the engines. In this particular instance, this A321 aircraft has reached the end of its useful life. However, the engines still have a tremendous useful life and 80% of the value in the aircraft is from the engines. Turbofan engines like these could be worth as much as $6 million a piece. But to find their true value, Callum has asked to examine their blades. There's only a certain amount of cleaning and chop blasting that these blades can have. So we need to take them off. They need to inspect the blades to see what the numbers are. And if the numbers are good, they're going to be happy. If the numbers aren't, then they're not going to be happy. It might not be a job the lads have ever done before, but if it's the blades Callum wants, it's the blades he will get. It might be worth taking a blade out now to see what it looks like. Yeah, it could do. It means you see it wants to turn. Yeah. So we take a blade out, but you really want to I turn. I know, yeah. As if we can just do this quickly. Yeah. But removing the blades is proving to be a tad more difficult than the lads first thought. Give them a good wobble. There's a special tool that straps across there. And it comes along there and then goes in there and you sort of lever it. That's good to know, Bob. It would be even more useful if the lads actually had one. But who needs fancy tools anyway when you've got technique like this? With the blade off, Bob needs to find out that all-important information for Callum. But what exactly is it and where can he find it? There's no markings on there at all. Be a magnifying job. I'll do. I'll nip in with this, okay. go and see Callum. Okay. So we'll wait for you to come back, shall we? Yeah, if you don't mind. OK, yeah. yeah no but what I did to get that out, just wedge my fingers in the back. Yeah. And as I wiggled it, just... Oh, right. Yeah. Come out, lovely. All right. Let's see if we can loosen them off. Yeah. With Bob off to find out what info he needs to give Callum, it gives Mark a chance to prep the blades for removal. Let's just hope he's not all fingers and thumbs. 
We'll check back on him later to see how he's getting on. Both young and old, the E-Cube lads are always learning, with Jack having earlier help to marshal in a plane and Bob having to swat up on a new engine part, it seems that the lads are having somewhat of a day of firsts. Another of E-Cube's apprentices is also learning the ropes, but for new lad Ali, it appears his number one task today is all about the number twos. I don't know if the box has been done. So what I'll leave the GPU here, you can do the box. Yeah. I'm not going to get the um, pooch one over there for you now. Just going to bring some gear over so we can um, empty and flush the lavs. Um, so it'll be Ali's, Ali's job to hook all that up. <laughs> <laughs> Good. God, boys got to learn, haven't they? <laughs> Well, I've never done it before, so I get to do something different every day and learn a lot from everyday work. Have you had your breakfast yet? No. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm <doing> it again. <laughs> There's still people who sort of like look at you and, oh, I ain't doing that, I ain't doing that. But I don't say it's a job, isn't it? But somebody's got to do it. I believe that's the toilet service panel. That's what I was looking for. Just above us. We need to push that underneath it. Get Ali in position. <laughs> so already open, was that bit? Yeah. Uh, who's lucky? I'm lucky. Who's lucky? <laughs> You've got a face for yeah. that coming down. Ever the voice of authority, <laughs> it sounds as if Sam is speaking from first hand experience. Right, and Ali, when you're doing this, you need to keep your mouth closed at all times, all right? Yeah. The last thing you want is any of that stuff going in there, yeah? All right? Stand to, sort of stand to the side when you're doing stuff, yeah, so you don't want to be directly underneath it. So when you put this on now, yeah, you put it on, it needs to be dead square going on, and then it will click. You'll hear a positive click when it's locked in place. If you don't hear a click, then you've just got to keep trying until we get it clicking, and you know, once you, once you hear the click, you know it's on, yeah? That's it. Sweet. First go, eh? Hey, Not well. bad. So you make sure your hose is in the thing, which it is. So now what you need to do, so we do the big uh, handle, just pull that down, no, no. yeah? There she blows. That wasn't too bad, as I thought sort of it. The, the smell is awful at the end of the part, the first is just tagging two pipes together, but when you remove the pipes, you smell that. It's not that bad, to be honest. <laughs> not too bad, is it, Ali? Well, in that case, you can do the other one. Make sure it clicks. You've got to stay... You're not square on there, Ali. You stick your tongue out, Ali. Things always happen when you stick your tongue out. <laughs> yeah, but don't put it in the plate. <laughs> in this company, there's a lot of experience here, and if some of these young lads don't listen, they'll, they'll, come, they'll come unstuck sometime, and uh, you'll spot them, and they're like, oh, I wish I'd listened to the old boys. Ali's clearly straining with his second movement, and now he's starting to draw a bit of an audience. Oh, come on, Ali. They're even watching you up at the tower. How am I going to do it now? Hey! Look at that. Why didn't you tell me that earlier? Well, you're supposed to learn. After such a big job, Ali, don't forget to flush. I forget them. You left her. Good job done. Earlier, Mark and Bob got to work on somewhat of a first for the E-Cube lads. To determine the value of the recently landed A321's turbofan engines, a customer has demanded that they individually remove and check the repair state of every single one of the fan blades. Okay. Can't see the numbers. Oh, you can't see them? So what we're going to have to do is take the full set off. Put them in the box. Put them in the box, transfer them to something in the hangar. They can read them Clean whilst them we're doing the other engine. OK. So it's blade one. It should now be just a matter of playing it by the numbers. That is, as long as the lads don't lose a few digits in the process. Yeah. Right, box number two. This could take a while. But as far as Callum, E-Cube's customer is concerned, it's well worth the wait. Yeah. 
It's also great for the passenger's pocket, too. Three. If every single airline had to replace every single part new every time it was needing repair, um, ticket prices would be double the price they are. You would not be able to get your cheap holiday to uh, the Bahamas or Tenerife or anywhere else. Number four. Number four. Five. Or oh, number five. The lads may only still be in the single digits, but it's clearly easy to lose count. All right, this one. What's this line? 14. Number 14, mate. Don't confuse the poor lad. It's like Tetris, really, isn't it? Just try and fit them all into three boxes and stuff. Ah. So, uh, 15. Well, why is the order changed? Because... Because oh, you want to stop it from... Balance. I got you. Now firmly getting into the groove, the lads seem to be making light work of what look like big bits of heavy metal. As the fan blades are responsible for producing 75 to 80% of the thrust of the engine, it's not the hot jet of air that comes out the back with the flames that produces the power. It's the uh, cold air that's distributed down the outside of the engine by the fan blades. So uh, the fan blades are very, very expensive. A complete set of fan blades can cost you almost half a million to a million dollars. With such a valuable investment out of action, the lads can't afford to be at sixes and sevens, but it looks like they're almost there. You got one tooth. <laughs> yes, it's toothless now. Yeah. And that's dinner. I declare it lunchtime. <laughs> happy days. And it seems everyone's happy that the lid has been finally closed on this job. With the blades in such good working order, Callum can command a lofty price when leasing out or selling this vital component. And that means it won't be long until his investment gets checked over and serviced by qualified technicians before going back out to work on the wing of another aircraft. Back at base and technician Timo's hard at work, showing that a workman is only as good as his tools. This is Big Willie. This is actually a name that, uh, that I chose when I was on the A320, actually. And I can picture the deer, me and my mate, walking off on the pan to look at an aircraft. And I say, I'm going to call him Willie. This is my, if you like, my mobile workshop. Uh, keep all my tools, all the equipment in here, in the bags. It gets bigger all the time. It's big now, so that's why I call him Big Willie. It's got charm and charisma, not unlike my good self. It could be a bit prettier, I have to say. I could, uh, I could tart it up a bit, but I don't get paid to do that, you see. I get paid to, uh, to work hard, which I do, boss. It's great, you don't want to go walking back in a hangar for, uh, for tools. Some hangars are half a mile long, uh, so the more you carry with you, the less messing about you have to do. Generally, where he goes, I go, or where I go, he goes. And right now, Timo is heading over to the hangar to remove the cockpit windows from an Airbus A319, where he will be ably assisted by Tall Ed. At ground level, this is a relatively straightforward task, but handling hugely expensive glazed units 30 feet above the hangar demands a specialist skill set and nerves of steel. Well, Timo is a good, wise old hand. Not much common sense, but, you know, he's a wise old hand still. The, the windscreens have the trim around. I thought the side windows no. gone. OK, OK. <laughs> so you're going to unscrew from outside, I push it out to you. That's it, yeah, right. Ed's a good guy. Um, he'll work all day, uh, really conscientious, uh, industrious. You can get a laugh out of him, and uh, he appreciates a joke, but it's like he doesn't have time for it. He just wants to get on with the job. Prep time is over, and final checks are done. All that are needed are the specialist tools, a scissor lift, and an old-fashioned head for heights. Yeah, I'm reasonably happy at height. I don't think about it. I mean, the fall would probably kill you, but these things are fairly safe. But working at height isn't the only danger. The cockpit windows are sealed with a toxic substance, Masternox. It's got uh, chromium in it. 
causes cancer. Banned in Germany and France. Uh, but when this aircraft was built, it was acceptable. The young apprentices now, they won't go anywhere near this stuff. It's a bit late for me. I'm just an old codger, so... If it hadn't killed me already, I'm probably okay. With the final bolt removed, the side windshield is inched out of position into the very experienced hands of Timo. It's heavy, it's, it's awkward, and you're always worried you're going to drop it. The back of your mind, I don't care who you are, you're always worried you're going to drop them because they're very expensive. That was just the warm-up. Now for the main windshield. Designed to aerospace specifications, they're constructed to withstand wind speeds of more than 600 miles an hour. You're going to need a, a spanner for the nuts on the back. Oh, well done. It's not rocket science. They're screwed in, so you take the screws out and you carefully lift them out, and it's, it's straightforward stuff. And if you stick to the basic rules of just being careful and taking your time, you shouldn't have a problem with it. Need a cup of tea now. Right now, the windshield worth several thousand dollars is sitting loosely in its frame. One slip now could be extremely costly. You happy with that, mate? Yeah, Mark says don't drop it. Yeah, he would. Weighing in at more than 55 pounds, suction cups are a must. Gently does it. OK. OK, you ready? Yep. Getting your fingers around the corner is quite difficult because you've got to get it around the corner as quick as you can to make sure it's secure. Yeah, nothing got broken, no one got hurt. Panic over, you know. It worries me, all this glass, you know, expensive glass. Success! But that's not always the case. When parts get damaged, they end up looking like this. Somebody made a mistake when they took the windscreen out and it, uh, it cracked. But as you can see, it's damaged beyond repair, and it'll have to be scrapped. The brake will have to be paid for by E-Cube and worth tens of thousands of dollars for a single pane of glass. It wouldn't take many slips to cause a serious risk to the business. Oh, right. After being stripped of all her valuable parts, she'll be ready for her final scrapping. Poor old girl will be done. Smashed up. She will indeed. St. Athen Air Base, as always, is chock a block with aircraft. And out among them is one of E-Cube's owners, Mike Korn, who's taking a walk around the lot, inspecting the 30 plus planes that are all stacked up and waiting to be stripped out and torn down. Long before E-Cube first took off seven years ago, the airbase here was originally set up before the start of the Second World War as a major aircraft maintenance unit for the RAF. And it was that military past that inspired Mike's boyhood dream of working in aviation. It actually originated here at St. Athen when I was a very small child and I used to come down to this location with my family to watch the old RAF air show that used to take place here. I had completely forgotten about the memory until I visited uh, as we were trying to find a location to site our business. We looked all over the UK. I stumbled upon St. Athen and came back here and suddenly had the memory that when I must have been four or five years old, I watched a, an old 1950s supersonic aircraft called the English Electric Lightning taking off here on full afterburner. And this aircraft took off down the runway, thundering away, and I was I felt myself shaking in the wake of it. It tipped on its tail, accelerated upwards until you couldn't see it anymore. And that actually had quite a significant impact on me. I thought to myself at the time how much I loved aviation. I never dreamed that I would be where I am now 50 years later. But um, I still look at images like this and think, yeah, this is marvelous. Mike's childhood love of aviation grew into what would today become E-Cube. Now, the culture of inspiring the younger generation is something at the very heart of the airbase. In a hangar just opposite E-Cube is the home of the South Wales Aviation Museum. Unlike our high-vis heroes, they work to preserve aircraft. Right now, the museum is having a visit from a couple of E-Cube's finest. Two battle-hardened veterans of the industry who have taken a quick five-minute breather from stripping aircraft 
for a trip down memory lane. Uh, this morning, um, we've, uh, we've come across to see a museum here. The museum is now on the site of the apprentice school that I attended 45 years ago. It's quite exciting to go in there and, and see... Uh, a bit longer than that, isn't it? Uh, it might be. I give or take. It might be uh, interesting to see exactly what... Did you what learn maths in there? Tornado? No, I skipped maths. Yeah, I can see Apprentice Shows. of the Year, three years in a row, though, thank you. I think it was my wire locking that was superb. Really? It took you three years to get through it, didn't it? Well, Most people yeah. do it too, isn't it? Too mostly, but hey. Anyway, let's hope we can have some fun in there. The museum that Timo and Di are visiting showcases some of aviation's finest design achievements. The museum was the brainchild of Gary Spores and John Sparks. So I found that John had a number of aeroplanes uh, that he's managed to co collect over the years, and I had a similar uh, amount of aeroplanes that I've collected. Uh, so it just made perfect sense, really, to come together and put them in, into one location. So, uh, you know, I've been collecting aeroplanes since, since well, aeroplane parts since I was a small boy, and uh, th this really is, is, is the size of my train set now, or our train set, shall I say. Yeah. It's a big boy's toy shed. <laughs> Our big boys, Timo and Di from EQ, certainly seem impressed. Even if these two engineering veterans can't quite recall the correct names of all the aircraft. Oh. Wow. Twin boom, what was that? That's an interesting one, isn't it? Uh, that's not the Nat, is it? No, no. Jet mm -hmm. Provost? No. no, no, Jet Provost. That's a Jet Provost out there, you old fool. Was it? I guess I'm not quite the aeroplane air cabbage I thought I was. Perhaps not. I'll, uh, yeah, we'll come back to that. I'll default to you. Hi, guys. Uh, you're Gary, yeah? Yeah, I'm Gary. How are you doing? I'm Timo. Timo, nice Hi, to meet Gary. You. Dave, nice so, to meet you. You're from EQ, yeah? We uh, are indeed, yes. Well, welcome to the other side of the business. Thank you. Oh, right. <laughs> I'm stuck. I can't remember what, the, what that is. So this is a vampire. Vampire. I said yeah. vampire. Was that the first... Uh, no, you said a gnat. For Timo and Di, their museum trip might be a fond reminder of life here at St. Atham before E-Cube. But the museum is not just for the more mature plane fanatic. It's also aimed at inspiring the next generation into the aviation industry. They will never make any money from it, uh, and if we do, we just plough it into buying new aeroplanes. That, that's the reality of it. Um, but it's something we both feel very strongly about, is preserving you know, the past for, for, for educating the future, really. I think one of the unique things about this museum is you can actually go and touch the aeroplane. It's not behind a fence, it's not behind a wire. You can actually look inside and you can touch it. And I think that's more of a success for us than anything really at the moment. We're getting a lot of families through, which is really good. And, and really, we're here to inspire the younger generation into aviation. That's the, the, the aim of what, of what we're trying to do. I think about, you know, a, a job that most people wouldn't consider aviation. Is, you know, in, in our day, everybody wanted to be a pilot or a train driver or a bus driver. But nowadays, kids don't think like that. So that's what this is about for us. Many of the planes here were donated by private collectors who share Gary and John's passion. Collectors like Dean, whose classic Hawker Sidley 125 can boast flying a rather notorious passenger as a child. It's famous because it used to belong to the, um, the father of Osama bin Laden, um, which, which makes it infamous more than famous. They bought the aircraft to transport Osama bin Laden and his siblings to colleges all over the world. We also know that the teddy bear that sits inside belonged to Osama bin Laden because we contacted um, the Oman Historic Society, who actually confirmed that the likelihood of it being his was very strong. But for Dean, this plane isn't just about looking to the past and its previous owner. It's about inspiring a passion for aircraft for future generations, an idea that's also integral to how E-Cube inspire their new apprentices. It is an expensive undertaking, but everybody cannot help come in something like this and their eyes light up and they think switches and dials. The only way you can really experience this stuff is to touch it, smell it and feel it. And I know we've got engineers who say the reason they do what they do was because their father put them in a, a cockpit of a, a Wessex helicopter 50 years ago. If you want to learn, you know, you have to get on the bike and ride it. And that's what the essence of this museum is. Timo and I are certainly enjoying getting up close and personal with the museum exhibits. Is this a Devon? 
Orange. So, well, we're getting close. So the next one's a Devon. Again, I'll keep, I'll keep it simple for you. This is what I would call an ex Air Force guy. Or, yeah. Yeah. OK, so we would call this a Pembroke. Um, All right. But it's an ex Navy one, so it's a Sea Prince. What they may lack in identifying aircraft, Timo and Di certainly make up for an experience of stripping them. This is a 747 fixed plate simulator, which has just come out of your hangar, actually. Now, with the tour complete, it's time for them to walk the few hundred metres back to E-Cube's main hangar and return to work, where they can pass on their extensive knowledge to the younger generation. With so many aircraft flying into E-Cube to be stripped and scrapped, it's certainly an inspiring place for the next generation of aircraft engineers to learn their trade. Right now, two of E-Cube's new apprentices have been tasked with the job of taking out valuable fuel sensors and valves from the wing tanks of a 767. It takes a certain physique to work in such a confined area of the plane, and Ahmed certainly fits the bill. A scavenge and a strip out of a single tank can bring in a haul of tens of thousands of dollars. And for Jack, this is also a valuable hands-on experience, adding to his study of aviation engineering that he's doing down the road at the local college. We've just taken the fuel probes out of the tanks, uh, which basically are used to just measure the amount of fuel and the quantity of fuel in the tanks, and then just put them to one side ready to uh, be clocked into the system later on. So this then, when, it's, when it reads the amount of fuel in the tank, um, it'll then send an electrical signal to the computers under the flight deck and then into the cockpit so the pilot can read them. You don't, you don't want to be caught short, and I think these are, these are very reliable and very uh, handy pieces of kit for the pilot to uh, recognise how much, to see how much fuel he's got. If he doesn't, then uh, it can be a bit messy. <laughs> in the topics we do in college, we look at diagrams and pictures of them, of, like, and videos of them, seeing them in the wing tanks, and, and then as when I'm here, I can actually get hands-on with them. I can actually see the size of them and get a good feel and good look at what they actually look like. And it helps me with re good revision as well for my exams. Um, so as ha um, Hamid uh, passes me down the fuel probes, I'm taking these uh, wires off of the uh, probe here because they're not needed anymore. So we just, she just take them off and put the, the nuts back on just to secure it. Well, I'm doing that and we'll factor as a spotter for Hamid uh, while he's in the tank because uh, I'm here to make sure that nothing goes wrong and uh, I can help them if something uh, does go wrong. Um, when you're in the tanks, um, the, the biggest concern is the um, lack of oxygen because of the kerosene. The kerosene vapors are very, very toxic. So, um, and they displace the oxygen. What's up? Uh, can you pass me the, the ratchet? The ratchet? Do you want the, the bits of it as well, yeah? Uh, there's a, a small extension. Small extension? I'm here just to make sure that he's... It's just the, the kerosene is quite toxic, like I said. Um, it, it's not the nicest stuff, and it can, it can actually cause suffocation and hypoxia, so... But it looks like Ahmed won't have to be stuck up in the wing for much longer. Uh, yeah? Yeah. Uh, there you go. Thank you. There you go, sorted. And it's a job well done. The value of that shut-off valve alone could be more than a $1,000. The E-Cube lads play their part in delivering a crushing end to dozens of commercial airliners every year. So they're more than used to saying goodbye, but sometimes it can be really hard to let go of the past. Today, the crew are downing tools to head out to the airfield and say a fond farewell to the Tornado family of military aircraft, as they are to be retired from active service by the RAF. As a thank you to all those who worked on these aircraft over the years, the RAF have organized a nationwide celebration. A formation of three Tornado fighter jets are due to make a final farewell fly past over St. Athen to honor this historic airbase and the engineers who work there. A lot of our guys have, uh, have worked on these, uh, on, on, the, on the Tornadoes over the years. Um, so yeah, it's quite important for them. So uh, yeah, we don't mind uh, losing a little bit of productivity for something like this. The lads won't be stripping out and scrapping these twin-engine combat jets themselves, as the RAF will do that. For the lads, this is a nostalgic moment to remember their youth and working here at St. Athen when it was a military airbase long before the birth of E-Cube. 
Having serviced tornadoes here when he was much younger, this farewell flypast is of particular poignancy to ex-RAF engineer Timo. The idea is they go around all these bases just bidding farewell to the people who worked on them, you know, like a final thank you. It's times past. Now there's the typhoon, of course. The tornado first entered service in 1979 and initially saw combat in the first Gulf War some 30 years ago. As is the way, the old inevitably makes way for the new. The whole fleet of RAF fighters will be retired and replaced by the newer F-35 Lightning II and the upgraded Typhoon. You spend a lot of time on these aircraft. I have uh, a lot of memories of tornadoes. I wasn't on them long, in fairness, two or three years. Fuel tanks I did mainly, and made a mess of those sometimes as well. I have no doubt that you did a marvellous job on those fuel tanks, Timo. With the lads now out in force to see the show, let's just hope those retiring RAF fighter jets are still being flown with military precision. The lake. <laughs> there it is. Only look. It makes you look. <laughs> All right. I think every young kid, he watches uh, the movies and, uh, and he sees these aircraft doing these fabulous things and, and they fall in love with all the aerobatics. It's exciting. With the flying formation of tornadoes nowhere in sight, the lads are starting to get a little bit impatient, especially Timo. You'd think they would know in a tower, wouldn't you? They'll be informed, wouldn't they? Yeah. Finally, the very distant growl of turbofan engines announces the long-awaited arrival of this trio of tornadoes. There they are. As this flying formation speed over St. Athen, the lads are treated to a deafening roar, a final salute to its former engineers. As the tornadoes thunder off into the distance, returning to their base in Norfolk, Timo is still holding out for more. No, I think they're coming back now. The show may be over, but it seems that Timo doesn't quite want to let go of the past just yet. There we go. Back to work time. <laughs> Before heading back to work in the hangar, Sam has just time to console his crestfallen chum. <laughs> I thought we deserved more than that. <laughs> I'm going to complain. With such fond memories of this iconic aircraft, it sadly looks like Timo's tears won't dry easily. We were uh, promised to fly past him. That was just a glimpse, wasn't it? There we are. Perhaps they're uh, late for something. It may be the end of an era for St. Athens' old guard. But for the next generation of the E-Cube crew, it's time to look to the future and create some new memories, as one young apprentice will soon discover. It's a new day with the sun shining brightly over St. Athens Air Base. And for one young crew member, the future looks particularly bright as Bob, the operations manager, has lined up a very special mission for him. We've got a um, A320 coming in from Portugal, uh, due in at 10 past 12. As you can see, it's a lovely day today, so I'm not envisaging any problems. Well, the plan is um, we've got Jack, a new lad. Um, we're going to let him marshal it in. We'll bring the aircraft in, check out with the crew, see them off, um, get them a taxi back to the airport, and then we'll put the aircraft to bed for the weekend. Young Jack hasn't been with the crew long, but in that time, he's really come of age. He may still only be 17 years old and work part-time while studying aircraft engineering at college, but Jack's enthusiasm and willingness to learn have earned him the respect of his colleagues. One of the previous aircrafts that came in, we showed Jack what to do, and I'm pretty confident now, so we'll let him do it on his own this time. This will be a huge step up in responsibility from what Jack experienced earlier. Bob believes this youngster is mature enough to spread his wings and marshal in a plane all on his own. Never thought I'd do it at this age, so I thought I'd have to be a bit older first, but uh, it's a good bit of experience, a good bit of fun to do, so we'll see how it goes today. Like Jack, many of the crew here have faced the same rites of passage. And although he may be now somewhat of a veteran of the job, Bob fondly remembers the days when he first had to marshal planes during his RAF training. In the Air Force, when we were taught to marshal, you'd have an instructor in a little jet provost, a little jet aeroplane, 
and you're only young sort of 16, 17 year olds, they'd have to go around corners, all sorts of different routes and the instructor would follow everything you did. So aircraft used to end up all over the place. Bob is bravely putting all his trust into the skills of this young apprentice to go it alone. Jack will be fine, yeah, yeah. It's a straight line, nothing should go wrong. The reason we marshal aircraft is um, the airfield's unknown to most of these flight crews. And also we're their eyes and ears. They, they can't see what's at the side of them or what's coming up in front. Um, you keep them up like that until they see you. Um, last time I was there, yeah. All the way up. Right up, up yeah, yeah, right up. And then, but I think last time I was told when they did the taxi off, then you start. That's it. Just straight in like that. Yeah. Working on a live airfield, you have to keep your wits about you because taxi and aircraft, you could be run over by them, sucked in by an engine, cause damage to them, endanger the life of the crew on board, plus your own life. Considering the dangers, there's no surprise that Jack's solo mission is normally accomplished by much more experienced crew. Just trying to follow how I was taught. I had a little research on <laughs> just before I uh, started this morning, so uh, just see if I can remember that and uh, go from there. And he needs to be ready to put his revision into practice as his moment in the spotlight is approaching fast. Just over X, uh, just descending now through uh, 17,000. So he's just on his way in or 10 minutes away, probably. The plane is now rapidly closing in, and soon Jack's solo skills will be put to the test. I'm anticipating radar vectors to visual runway 07, basically. All too suddenly, Jack's mission has broken through the clouds. As the plane hurtles towards him at 140 knots, it's time to conquer his fear and focus. Jack must now face his solo sortie head on. Jack's done it, his first solo marshalling. With the aircraft hitting its marks, this young apprentice must be feeling on cloud nine. Really, really good, straight on the line, so uh, get after that. It went a lot better than I thought it would. For my first ever time, like, uh, doing it on my own, it was quite nerve-wracking, quite scary, <laughs> quite nervous, but, yeah, I got in the end, it was all sorted, so... so came in uh, and went all as I wanted to. With the Portuguese crew safely off the aircraft and taking a final picture of their old friend, Jack is inside getting a special memento of his own. The safety card. I get allowed to take uh, one off the aircraft, so uh, yeah. That's why I grab one before they all, uh, before I'm not able to. Souvenir. Just for me, because uh, of what I've done with the aircraft, so. It's the beginning of a collection that Jack will certainly keep adding to as the years fly by. And who knows, maybe the day will come when he's as seasoned as Bob is now. And he stood on this very taxiway, telling a plucky young recruit just what he thinks of him. Yeah, no, he's got it, got it all perfectly right. We're happy now, confident that he can do that on his own now, from now on. So, be part of the crew. <laughs> Coming from you, Bob, that's praise indeed. It really is enough to make one's heart sore. Such is the circle of life that as one aircraft arrives at St. Nathan, another is prepared for a quick departure. Every valuable component and clasp, switch and slat, panel and part has been removed from this Boeing 767. So, there's only one thing left to do. Rock out the heavy metal. It may now look a sorry sight of scrap metal, but it's worth remembering that many of the aircraft's old parts will lead a new life in a variety of other aircraft that are still in service across the world. And so, the cycle rolls on. And as long as there are planes in the sky, aircraft parts will always be in demand. Until next time, bon voyage.